what happens to the dollar is going to be a front and centre of what's going on in emerging markets and what you cover. So what are your forecasts? Thank you for having me. Well, I think we are now just having a reaction uh, to the fact of this new second wave in, in Europe that certainly is promoting some risk aversion. And naturally, the dollar tends to get stronger uh, in these moments. But uh, we still think that medium term, particularly when we look for next year, we think that the scenario is for a gradual recovery of the global economy, partic particularly with China doing quite well, and the outlook for emerging markets should be uh, uh, okay. And actually, uh, broadly speaking, dollar, in our view, will get weaker versus emerging markets. Julia, of course, the big event, it is the alpha, it's politics, U.S. election next week, just days away now. Uh, tell us about how an emerging market uh, uh, investor should be positioning themselves ahead of it. Right. Well, first of all, we think it's uh, better to avoid any extreme positions for two reasons. One, we know there is a big element of uncertainty in, in any case. Uh, we learned that the hard way in 2016. Um, the second element is that investors should keep in mind uh, that for the medium and long term, uh, a lot of things will remain the same. So, for example, the tension uh, between U.S. and China that is particularly important for Asia, this is something that would uh, remain in place regardless of the result of uh, uh, U.S. elections. So I think uh, uh, that's, uh, you know, uh, the starting point. Well, absolutely. And a lot of it is uh, down to uh, what's been going on with regards to this, uh, uh, this trade war and uh, other friction taking place between Beijing and Washington. Uh, but that's not going to go away no matter who wins. Uh, isn't that true, Julia? True. So I think... Uh, Let's put it this way. We do expect some uh, uh, reactions in the near term uh, for the election, and particularly on the FX. Um, I think what's uh, uh, worth highlighting is that the bias in the market is for a victory of Biden. And there is also this perception that Biden uh, will be more diplomatic and probably um, also will uh, uh, try to avoid the tariffs, the trade war. Uh, so, broadly speaking, there is a perception uh, that with Biden, um, the CNH, uh, which is the uh, anchor for um, FX in Asia, will probably do a bit better. So I think it's uh, uh, fair to say uh, that we should expect a bit of a more positive reaction on the FX Asia, led by the renminbi, uh, the CNH, um, in, in the scenario of Biden's uh, victory while some negative re, uh, uh, knee-jerk reaction uh, against the renminbi in case uh, uh, there is a Trump's victory. Uh, Julia, let's talk about the renminbi. The yuan has been strengthening. Can the yuan strength put a limit to the dollar's climb, to the dollar's rebound? Right. Well, I think it's, it's fair to say that particularly in, in the scenario in which we have uh, uh, Biden's victory, uh, even with the second wave, uh, uh, we think that uh, the renminbi will work as an anchor uh, for the Asia effects. So in, in that scenario, I think it's true uh, that even though we may have some sort of risk aversion uh, because of these concerns uh, with the second wave in Europe in particular, we think that it's unlikely uh, that the renminbi will get too uh, weak uh, uh, in that scenario. And that's certainly a positive for Asia FX. Julia, what's apparent right now is that volatility is climbing. In fact, of a night, we saw how volatility surged past 40. In this kind of environment, where do you seek shelter in Asia? What's, what's looking good to you? Right. So, again, in taking into account that we think that the renminbi strength is rooted on, on fundamentals, uh, and now that we have more uh, uh, concern with, with Europe, for example, we think that the CFETS basket will hold up well. And a key component of the uh, uh, basket is versus euro. So we think renminbi, for example, versus euro 
is something that uh, uh, probably will hold, hold up well uh, uh, looking forward. And more st strategically, we think that when we look into 2021, uh, the scenario is one in, in which eventually we'll get the vaccine and we'll see a broader uh, global recovery. And we think that particularly North Asia will certainly benefit of, in, in that scenario. So the Korea one that has been performing well, our view is that uh, probably uh, uh, there is room uh, for further outperformance of the Korea one for next year, for example. Having said that, in in the bond market, do you see the surge in volatility unsettling junk bonds? Because we saw uh, the biggest high yield ETF reporting an outflow of almost nine hundred million dollars. Right. Well, on the high yield space, I think it's important to differentiate the uh, response, the near term response. That, uh, as I mentioned before, we are certainly now. Uh, going through some uh, sort of risk aversion related to the second wave. That certainly is justified. And whenever we get uh, uh, those outflows, we see some pain uh, uh, in the market. But when, again, we look forward uh, strategically, our sense is that uh, Asia will continue to outperform. Uh, so fundamentally, it's a good story uh, versus US and Europe. And when we look on the valuation side, we see clearly uh, that uh, both in the IG and in the high yield space, uh, Asia uh, bonds, the dollar bonds, are clearly offering a decent pickup. So, for example, for the quality high yield, we see something like 150 bips on average in the high in the in the double B high yield uh, Asia versus US. So it's a compelling story, and taking into account that again, we we continue to see. Uh, uh, in our baseline scenario, um, uh, Asia outperforming U.S. Uh, and Europe. So we think that uh, that kind of spread uh, that we, we are getting in, in Asia, it's, it's good enough and a good opportunity for investors.